Hi everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis. Tonight we are joined by the nicest guy in Gnosticism, Bishop Timothy Mansfield, and we're going to talk about temple theology, uh, some interesting theories that have come out of uh, some recent uh, research and, and some speculation about it. And It's going to be a great show, you don't want to miss it, coming up on Talk Gnosis. Hi everybody, I'm Father Tony, and Jonathan is joining me once again as my co-host. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. So we've got uh, a topic that is uh, near and dear to your heart, I know. Uh, so I think I'm just going to sit back and let you and our guest uh, kind of hash it out and talk about all the interesting stuff that you're going to talk about. And uh, speaking of our guest, Bishop Timothy Mansfield from Sydney, Australia. Hello, Tim. Welcome to the show. Hey, Father Tony. How you doing? Great. Good to see you. All right, so I just you know, go get into it. What what are we talking about here? And uh, Jonathan, you can you can take it from here. Go ahead. Actually, I'm going to uh, I'm going to pass the the, the torch over to uh, to Bishop Tim. We're just going to pass the potato around all show. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but we're we're going to try to do a little introduction to temple theology, which is uh, a radically new way of looking at the origins of Christianity, Islam, Judaism and our precious Gnosticism, and it comes out of the work of a theologian in biblical studies uh, um, doctor named uh, Margaret Barker, head of, head of England. Um, so we're going to do our best to kind of sum up her thought in, in this intro show, and then we're going to kind of talk about more how it connects Gnosticism in our podcast, which you should all uh, donate to on Patreon so you can listen to it quicker before it comes out. Um, Bishop Tim, what... Can you, can you kind of give us your elevator speech for the, the thought of Margaret Parker and, and what temple theology <laughs> is and why it matters? For sure. An, an elevator speech about temple theology is um, a, yeah. a hilarious <laughs> idea. So Margaret Parker, is a, um, she's a Methodist preacher. She's an alumnus of the University of Cambridge um, where she studied theology. And she's devoted the last sort of 20 years to studying ancient Christianity. Um, and she's kind of been scratching at some, some key sort of puzzles and paradoxes in our understanding of how early Christianity came about, um, which I'm not going to go into what the, the puzzles exactly are, because even talking about that takes a good 15, 20 minutes <laughs> all on its own. She's written about a dozen books at this point and, and a, a large number of scholarly publications in journals and, and conferences in, in biblical theology. Um, she's a really, really well regarded researcher and um, her theories are not mainstream, but they're also not particularly fringe. Um, she's well regarded, she gets uh, invited to, to guest speak at a, at a good bunch of academic conferences. So this isn't kind of wacky fringe stuff, it's not kind of, you know, freak and gandy um, kind of material, it's, it's good solid academic research. Having said that, it's incredibly difficult to summarize because the sheer range of sources that Dr. Barker uses to assemble her theory um, is mind-boggling. The bibliographies take up, you know, a fifth of the book half the time. Um, and it's quite difficult to, like, the reasoning's very widespread. She's done a, um, a couple of really nice books, Temple Theology and Introduction to Temple Mysticism, that, um, that pulls some, some key pieces together in a really digestible form, which has been great. Um, so her key... Her key speculation that she's been grounding in archaeological, biblical, extra-biblical research um, is that the key thing to understand in order to understand both early Christianity and from our point of view Gnosticism, classical Gnosticism, is to understand the difference between the theology of the first temple, Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, and the theology that was prevalent during the period of the second temple. And to understand that, you have to understand a key moment in the history of Israel. And that's the reign of King Josiah. So Josiah reigns, it would be great if I had all these figures um, under my finger. Jonathan, of course, does. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I got it right here. Well, what, what, maybe about 2,500 years ago, is that right, for King Josiah? Yeah, so just, just before the Babylonian captivity. Josiah was yeah. king of Israel just before the Babylonian captivity. And, and um, what he does is... is uh, cataloged in um, partly in the book of Jeremiah, partly in I think Chronicles. Um, what what Josiah does is the the reform of Judaism. So the way it's presented in the in the canonical Old Testament is that the the priests at the time of Josiah discover the five books of Moses, um, which 
haven't been around for some period mm -hmm. prior to that. And the people of Israel have fallen into heresy and, and misdeed. And the priests in discovering the five books of Moses have discovered the true religion of Israel and what it, what it has always been meant to be. And so Josiah sets about um, demolishing all the things that aren't part of the, the vision of of Hebrew religion that's depicted in the five books of Moses. Right, so, sorry to interrupt, when we say discover the, these five books, should we be putting in some, some air quotes? All of a sudden, oh, the, totally. the king and these priests find these books that radically change the religion. Yeah, to, just, just discuss, look, it's kind of implied they're in a, they're in a cupboard. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, <laughs> actually. It is. Unexpected... Yeah. Yeah. Someone finds an unexpected closet at the back of the, yeah. the temple and... Um... <gasps> Five books? Who knew? Um, right. So, but, but, and it documents exactly what gets thrown out of the, um, what gets excluded from Hebrew religion over a period, of, uh, a period of time, over several years. So there's a series of purges where Josiah um, cleans a bunch of things out of the Holy of Holies in the temple, um, removes a bunch of things from regular temple worship, represses a popular piety um, of Asherah, Mm -hmm. So, who's a feminine, um, a feminine deity, often called the wife of Yahweh, um, or the wife of God. Um, right, sorry, and I know we've got a lot of material to get through in the next 10 minutes, but just to, I think a lot of uh, listeners and watchers would be like, wait a minute, there was a female deity in the Jewish temple that, that a king and some priests kicked out? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Um, yeah. And the way that's presented to you in the Bible is that this is evidence that the people of Israel have, have fallen into error, that they're, they're no longer um, with the, the true religion of God. Now, this is, okay, so we have, we have to circle back on this a little bit, but the, this is absolutely the case. We'll go into more detail on it in the podca podcast, but Josiah suppresses all these things, right? Mm -hmm. His son, he dies, his son takes over as king, and so there's this kind of reformed Hebrew religion mm -hmm. um, is what, what we're presented with in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Just as Josiah's son takes the throne, the Babylonians invade. They take mm -hmm. the entire priesthood and aristocracy of of Israel captive and mm -hmm. take them off to Babylon. And the captivity lasts for I think two hundred and fifty years. Yeah. So, the people left in Israel are the common people, and the priesthood and the aristocracy, who were the the ones behind, you know, that's who's benefited by these reforms, are mm -hmm. taken off to Babylon. Two hundred and fifty years pass. At the end of 250 years, the captives return from Babylon mm -hmm. to Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, just imagine that moment for a second, because at that point of return, those captives have been practicing this version of Hebrew religion in the context of Babylon, mm -hmm. augmenting it, um, kind of crafting it, refining it, honing it. And what they come back with is this kind of refined and honed version of, from their point of view, what Hebrew religion has always been. Right. But meanwhile, this repressive king who's told the common people they aren't allowed to carry on the kind of um, religion they've been carrying on within living memory from their point of view, and so they've just gone back to what they were doing <laughs> while the captives are away in Babylon. So you yeah, end up with these sense. two versions of what Hebrew religion is meant to be, the popular version and the aristocratic and priestly version. And, this is, and there's lots of archaeological evidence for those two versions through the whole, through the whole piece. So what we're presented with is as Jewish religion at the time of the at the time of, of Jesus um, in the first in the first century is that version that went off to Babylon. It was reformed by Yeshua, went off to Babylon, and came back. And the reason we put air quotes around discovering the five books of Moses is that, as far as we can tell from the documentary evidence, the source books that make up the five books of Moses, and then the final forms of the five books of Moses as compiled, were compiled at the earliest during the Babylonian captivity, and at the latest in their final form in the first century AD, first century of the Common Era. So the, it's, it's, a, it's a helpful mythic narrative, and as Gnostics we're very familiar with helpful mythic narratives, um, to say that, that the Pentateuch um, is this ancient thing which has always been true, because it, it seems from the documentary hypothesis, from, from um, critical scholarship, that actually it was composed due to the work of multiple scribes and, and editors over a period of time, around this exact period of time. Right. So what this is giving us is two distinct versions of Hebrew religion. And one version is what persists today as Judaism. And the other version, and this is, my, this is Barker's 
really fairly controversial hypothesis. The other version is what persists as Christianity. Right. So that what Jesus is teaching is not an entirely new religion composed, you know, that God downloads this entirely new religion into the head of Jesus of Nazareth, who then teaches it to the people. Mm -hmm. What he's teaching is actually the theology left over. It's a memory of the theology of the first temple, an orally preserved memory of the first temple, preserved amongst the diaspora communities who are not in Jerusalem, who are in Alexandria, or in Arabia, or in other places where, where Jewish people live. Um, mm -hmm. And he's teaching a, a popular version of this mystical theology to ordinary people, which is a, a kind of an oral memory of that, that theology of the first temple. He's he's part of the street that's have left. <laughs> oh sorry he's he's part of the street that's that's hundreds of years old this, this mystical first temple theology so it's not not necessarily an innovation from him it's something that's continuing on and is is intermingling it could be found in the other streams of Judaism but uh, in some ways is opposed to this aristocratic uh, Hebrew religion is that right. yes right. Right, 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 right. Now, obviously, we're living 2,000 years later, right? And so Judaism in its form today is a very different thing to Judaism is it in its form, you know, 100, 100 BCE, right? So we're not, we're not talking about exactly the same thing. But there is, this, th there is this direct opposition, and you see that opposition cast in very stark terms um, in, in the Gospels written around that time and in a lot of Jewish writing around that time. So, yeah. so obviously, the interesting thing is what is that First Temple theology? What does it look yes. like? What shape does it take? And what bearing does this all have on Gnosticism? Because Gnosticism is another um, sort of, you know, dialectical opposition at around this time. Um, and I think that's probably something we have to go into as we get, <laughs> as we get into the podcast. This might, this might all be teaser, this, this opening bit. Father Tony? Yeah, no, well, <clears throat> we've got about five minutes. So um, can you, can you g give a kind of brief overview of what the temple theology is as opposed to the other version of Judaism? Like, what's, what are the specific differences, or some of them? Totally. There's some, I mean, there's, there's just some, there's some gobsmacking differences. Um, so the key thing is that the whole of First Temple theology um, is rooted in a perception of the day, of day one of creation. Not the first day, but day one. The day of unity, before all things were made, in which all things rested in the first father. Um, so there are three fundamental persons in First Temple theology. The Father, the Most High, the Ancient of Days are the titles used um, in the Old Testament. And what we see in the Old, Te the, the Old Testament as we have it today, particularly in the five books of Moses, we see the gluing together of two different terms for God. Mm -hmm. The Lord, yod heh vav -Hey, Yahweh, Jehovah, and the Most High, the Ancient of Days, El. And these are two distinct gods, but they've been through the work of multiple editors, and there's evidence in the, in the original Hebrew text that these two names for God have been glued together um, and treated as though they're a single person. Barker's hypothesis is that in the first temple they were distinct persons and that Yahweh is the son of the Most High. Um, and the high priest, who is the king, is the incarnation of Yahweh. So there's the father and the son. And there's wisdom. Um, the great lady, the great lady of Jerusalem, who is the wife of El, the wife of God Most High, and the mother of Yahweh, um, who is incarnate in the mother of the high priest, the mother of the king, in Jerusalem. So the great lady of Jerusalem is also the incarnation of the, the feminine form of God, um, and th that feminine form of God is the archaeological evidence of like thousands of pillar figurines all throughout Judea. They're mm -hmm. little objects of popular piety, heavy-breasted mother figures, um, obviously venerated in homes all over, this, um, all over this region during exactly the time when we're told that Hebrew religion is monotheistic. Uh, Barker's hypothesis, and this is grounded in archaeological evidence and in textual evidence um, from Hebrew communities in diaspora, is that it's not a monotheistic religion. It's a religion with at least three divine persons. Um, the, the other real aspect of creation that gets picked out in First Temple theology is the one and the many. So the divine personages that make up the angel host, um, or, or you might call the pleroma, <laughs> the fullness, mm -hmm. the fullness we might. of God's being in the world. You might, you might just use just such a term. So all the key elements of the sort of Gnostic theology you see 
um, emerging in the first section of the Sacred Book of John are all present in Barker's account of temple theology. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that's starkly present is the emphasis on the covenant, so the bonds of creation that hold the whole of creation together, the fact that the nature of manifest existence is that we're constantly drifting out of covenant, constantly the bonds are constantly being stressed and broken through the nature of, of sin in the ordinary world, um, and the necessity of atonement, of bringing the bonds of creation back together. Um, and so the, the annual ritual of atonement that you see in the first temple period, which is abolished in the second temple period, Barker makes the claim that the Eucharist as we know it is grounded not in the Passover feast, but in the ritual of atonement. And she makes direct parallels between the first temple ritual of atonement and what we see in the, the elements of the Eucharist. So what Christ is teaching is a kind of kind of an open source version, if you like, of first temple ritual practice, of first temple theology, and of first temple mysticism. All the elements of what we see in Christianity, including Mariology, the veneration of the Mother of God, of the Theotokos, which appears really early in Christian practice. It's not something kind of, you know, there's this kind of uh, popular idea that it's kind of, well, it's ISIS worship kind of sucked into Christianity somehow <laughs> <laughs> via an unknown mechanism. <laughs> But, but not the case, not the case. None of these things, um, she actually said, okay, so this is the, the I, we're not going to be able to go into this in any detail even for the rest of the, for the, rest of the podcast, <laughs> but um, she actually makes a claim at some point. There's all this stuff about, uh, this, this stuff you, you see a lot in kind of older biblical scholarship about how what you're seeing in Gnosticism is kind of the grafting of Neoplatonism onto mm -hmm. Christianity. And it's some kind of blend of Neoplatonism and Christianity. And Barker kind of like does an end run around the whole thing and goes, Hmm, maybe, or maybe, <laughs> actually, what Pythagoras teaches Plato, Pythagoras learned in the temple. Because Pythagoras was educated in Syria. Mm. And, there's a, and, and what you see in the Timaeus is the teaching of the Hebrews. So, all so that Greek Bach stuff. is claiming all that Greek stuff, all that Plato stuff is a Greek kind of... Um, you know, very heady kind of ticky-tacky box and line diagram Greek version <laughs> of what Pythagoras picks up in being taught the mysticism of the temple. Really beguiling, really fascinating stuff. Um, <laughs> Barker goes on for days. It's like a vast... So I should have actually opened with a, um, with a public health warning that uh, <laughs> if you start reading Mark Barker, it's a brain virus. Jonathan and I are both infected. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's rabbit holes within it's, rabbit holes within rabbit holes. And it totally changes the way you read everything to do with Gnosticism, everything to do with early Christianity. It totally changes the way you read the Bible. It totally changes the way you pray, for me at least. It's completely changed the way I pray. It's completely changed the way I understand the Eucharist. And I can't look at it a different way now. So I just have to caution anybody, <laughs> if you're going to listen to the podcast, then, you know, warn a friend, get ready to pull out at the right moment. Never read a Margaret Barker book. It's just going to hurt your brain. It, it'll, yeah. it'll change the way you think, see the world. Always good advice. Get ready to pull out at the right moment. And this is the right moment for the video show. Uh, so <laughs> we are going to wrap things up right here and uh, pick it up in the podcast when we record that in a few minutes. For the rest of you, we will see you in a couple of days when that podcast comes out. However, if you are a Patreon supporter, I'm posting both of these episodes like three days early before the video show even comes out. So wow. do I know, right? It's crazy. So. Wow. Uh, both shows. Yeah, both shows at the same time. You don't even have hey, to wait. I'd like to say I'm a Patreon supporter of the show and you should yes. be too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You can donate as little as a dollar, right? A dollar per it could be, uh, Yeah, a dollar per yeah. episode. And, you know, you, episode. you set your monthly cap so you never go over what you think you're going to, you know, you can afford for a month. It's very easy and you set it once and you never have to think about it again and you support the show and all the new stuff that we're trying to get done. So anyway, do that, patreon.com slash gnostic, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash gnostic and you'll hear about that again at the end. Um, next week coming up, I just wanted to tease, we've got uh, Monsignor Jordan Stratford, also from the Apostolic Joe and I Church, I believe, right, uh, Jonathan? Mm -hmm. Yep, and we're yep. going to be talking about alchemy. So. You're not going to want to miss that one. That one's going to be a fun show. Anyway, so that's we're going to we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you, Tim Mansfield, Bishop of the Apostolic Joe and I Church, Mark Timotheos, for joining us once again. And is, is there any place you want to send people to find you on the internet? 
joanite.org, I guess, J-O-H-A-N-N-I-T-E. Uh, yep. <laughs> and if you are anywhere in the uh, Sydney or, you know, any of the, I don't know, Australia is kind of a tiny place. Pretty much you can any, probably <laughs> anywhere on the eastern seaboard of Australia. Yeah, yeah. You can find, you can find Bishop Mansfield all up and down the east coast and, uh, you know, very rarely, occasionally in New Zealand, I've also heard. So um, it's also true. Yep. So anyway, uh, check that out, joeandite.org, and you can find all that information on there. For the rest of you who are watching along at home, we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.